Scripture reading this morning will be out of the book of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. I therefore, the prisoner of Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling of, with which you were called, with all loneliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit of the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all and in and you all. Well, I'm sorry to have to announce that John and Beth Henry uh, will be leaving uh, this coming week or this week, and this will be their last Sunday here. Uh, John and Beth have been here only a few months, but uh, they have uh, been so faithful and loyal and, and just a darling couple, and we will miss them dearly. Um, they insist on taking their sweet little daughter, Susanna, with them, uh, Savannah, I mean, and uh, 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 we will miss her too. What a precious little girl. Uh, we, um, I, I taught them the, uh, uh, as best I could the safety chain uh, last Tuesday night, and so they are taking their Bibles and their packet of material, and they'll be going no telling where in the days ahead. Uh, they um, will be going, first of all, to uh, Fort Lewis, uh, Washington, and then eventually making their way back here, they say. So uh, we are, we'll be excited to have them come back and be with us here at Northwest. They're a wonderful young couple. In that passage that Joe read a moment ago, you'll notice in verse 4 where it says, one body, one body. And uh, in the book of Ephesians, at chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, it uh, describes what that body is. It says the, the church is the body of Christ. So that analogy, that comparison of church and body uh, is mentioned there, but I want to tell you it's mentioned throughout the rest of the New Testament. Time and time again, you have that one body expressed. Uh, and, and of course, that goes along with uh, New Testament teachings. If you want to understand the nature of the church, you must understand its oneness. And uh, I want to ask you as I begin this lesson, uh, what do you believe about the one church? What do you believe at this point? And I hope, uh, if need be, you'll do some changing about your attitudes about the church. And if you do have the correct understanding, that you'll have it even stronger as we uh, finish out the lesson in a few moments. But I have three steps, and I hope you have one of our outlines to follow along. I hope you'll be able to study it later uh, and spend some time with it, because we won't have time to go into all the references and uh, spend a, a great deal of time with uh, any of them, but they're, they're there for you to look at and refer to later. First of all, I want to talk about the revelation of Scripture. What does the Word of God say about the nature of the church? Well, the Lord makes it so plain in His Word that there is one church, one church. In fact, in Matthew 16, 18, one of the few times in all of the Gospels, he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Singular, one. Not a multitude of them, but one church. It's as plain as it possibly can be. But then when you move farther into the New Testament, you find this coming out over and over again. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 4, makes the point there are many members in that body, but there is one body. Many members. You can have members around the world, but they're still a part of that one body, the church. Verse 5 of that same uh, passage in Romans 12. Again, the, the uh, repetition. One body in Christ. One body, one church. 1 Corinthians then, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 17. We though many are one body, one church in other words. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. We're one body, all members of one body. You, you, you see with the repetition, are we getting the point of what it's saying? Verse 13, 
We are baptized into that one body. Baptized into that body. Verse 14, again, one body, one church, but with many members. And we're members as human beings, as individuals. Verse 20, many members and yet one body, the church. Move to Galatians. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28. You are all one in Christ. One in Christ. Galatians chapter 2 verse 16. He reconciles both the Jews and Gentiles to God in one body. You know, if ever there was a situation for dividing the church, of saying we need two kinds of churches, it would have been in the first century with the cultural, racial, religious differences at the outset with Gentiles and Jews. Wouldn't it have been nice, you would first think, to have, say, in the city of Corinth, a Jewish church with their background and their heritage, with their understanding of the Old Testament already and all the wonderful things they could uh, uh, have and, and uh, uh, in, enjoy from their background. A Jewish church. And then the Gentiles could have theirs. And uh, I, I mean, if ever denominationalism would have had an opening in the will of God, it would have been in that first century world, two kinds of churches. And yet, as you will notice in these passages over and over again, in the writings of the Apostle Paul, he stresses those two, Jew and Gentile, need must be in the same body, in the same church. We don't need two. One is plenty. One is what God's will is all about. Again, from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 5. That's where we were a moment ago with Joe in the text. There's one body. And of course, again, that's the church. One Lord. Well, do we divide up the Lord and say, well, he's for, for uh, let's slice him up into different uh, uh, sections and, and call our Lord any uh, number of ways. No, one Lord. One faith. In fact, in Titus 1.4, the same Apostle Paul talks about our common faith. It's common. We share it together. And again, we'll come back to that in a few moments. But faith is critical to the one body. And then, of course, one baptism. Not three or four or whatever. But here when Paul is writing in Ephesians uh, in about 61 AD, he says there's one. Only one, and that's it. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, you are called in one body. And then, of course, in that same book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 24, makes the point, his body, which is the church. So you, you understand uh, with me that the church is the body, and there's one of them. And then Ephesians 5, verse 30, you are members of his body of obviously the church. In addition, there are some other points that are really making the same uh, idea clear to us. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, and 22, uh, two, chapter, two, uh, chapter 2, verse 2. Be of one mind and one accord. You're, you're in the church, you're a part of this, and you need to be of one mind and one accord, united together. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Be of one mind, and by the way, this is the same thing that Peter, the apostle, said in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Be of one mind. You're together in this in your thinking process. So I, I, I can't begin to make it any clearer than that. I, I think you're looking at the New Testament with the, the simplest of language, heralding this a, a, as plainly as it can possibly say, be said. There is one church. Point number two, sadly, point number two, the reality of our times. It's as opposite to the Lord's will as possible. You have an extreme over here, surely, just in following what the New Testament affirms and says clearly. And what we look at today in our world, it is just as opposite as it poss possibly can be. Because we have division, divisions, divisions. We have multiplying divisions. You know, you usually think as a, as a 
a, a schoolboy going uh, uh, in and learning about math, you have multiplication growing and division, you know, uh, you're narrowing it. But uh, in, in our religious world, it's, it's going the opposite. You have multiplying of divisions, uh, which sounds like it ought to be an oxymoron, but it's not. It's the thing that's happening constantly in our world over and over again. You have churches literally by the thousands. Can anyone think that that is the will of God, that he desires that, that it, that it is his pleasure for those that are supposed to be following him to be sliced up into amazing differences? And I mean across the board some of the most uh, unbelievable divisions in the religious world. That's the reality, though, that we face today. And there are a number of what I call denominational assumptions uh, that the, the Lord accepts the things as they are. I think most of us would probably say that that's uh, the way most people think, that uh, this uh, uh, division, the disunity, is just something that's uh, there and we just accept it for what it is and live with it. People can do and uh, believe anything in the name of Christ. And these are not minor things. These are not like the size of church buildings or the form of, of a, a building or, or how big the parking lot would be or lighting or chandeliers or whatever. We're not talking about that, my friends. We're talking about incredible differences. And I could go through a whole litany of, of beliefs and on every one of just foundational subjects, there would be a variety of approaches. About God, for instance. About Christ. Is he the son of God or a nice man? And, and, and a wide variety of, of views between those two. And, and you could go on and on and on. You can do and believe anything in the name of Christ today. And... In the midst of that, gain a substantial following. And that's the way it is. That's the reality. The disunity, the factions, the divisions are almost overwhelming. And I mean that for people that are serious about what we discussed in the first part of this lesson. It's almost overwhelming as you, you travel about and you see this, this denomination, this, this one, and this one. And even in a, a, a town like Lawton, a city like Lawton, we have un overwhelming uh, groups of churches uh, of all different stripes. Is that God's will? Well, we're talking about the reality of things, but we've also talked about the revelation of Scripture with that in mind. So we move to our last point, the response we bring to this dilemma. And I want you to think with me. I don't want you to be thinking of what I think as a preacher what the leaders of this church think, or what the churches of Christ, or anybody else thinks. I want you to think about this. It's important for you to know and believe something about this that is indeed a very important biblical subject. Now, most of the time it's not thought about, not talked about, but you need to know about it. What do you believe on this? I'll ask that question as we end the lesson. It is a dilemma. Is it the one church of Scripture? Is there one? And should we be in that church? Or we simply face the staggering number in denominationalism? Now, we have, a, we have to deal with that. And I wanted you to ask that and deal with it yourself. Really, what is your response? Really? Is it a matter of indifference to you? In other words, so what? So what? I don't, I don't really want to deal with this. So what? Or is it a matter of compromise? I, I see all of this uh, disunity. I know the Bible teaches that. But I mean, after all, uh, let's live with it. And even surrender. And just saying, basically, uh, we're one of many. Let's be satisfied with that and let's get on with it. Could it be just, uh, again, another way of saying what I've said? To live and let live. We have our certain convictions Maybe you want to call them traditions. I, I, that may be a good word at times, but it's not a good word in this context. But uh, just simply live and let live. Or sort of go into what we uh, could call a holy haze. 
You know, when you're not seeing clearly, you're uncertain, you just sort of put it on hold, if you will. Un we're unclear about really what our convictions are on this. Well, I want to ask you to be clear and convicted. Are you and I in the one church of the New Testament? Are you in that one church that you read about in the Bible? Now, there are not a multitude of churches in the Bible. There's just one here. Are you in that church? Or are you in just one of many denominations? And there are thousands of options. Now, you make the decision. You make the call. I believe with all of my heart, and I wouldn't be here this morning or in any other pulpit in the land. I believe with all of my heart that you can be in the church you read about in the Bible. Simply in that church and no other. And never become a part of a denomination. Never become a, a part of this maze that we have all around us. You can be simply a Christian and a part of that one church, that one body of Christ. And here's how I would explain it to you and, and, and to a child that could understand it, I believe. On the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, it says there that the people heard the good news for the first time. I mean the good news in the sense of a resurrected Lord and that he died for, their, for the sins of the people and now the people were ready to respond. Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. Men and brethren, what must we do? Now, you talk about people that understood and believed the message. They are cut to the heart, the passage says. And they say, men and brethren, what must we do? So there it is. They're lost. They need the truth. They need to obey the truth. They know that. Men and brethren, what must we do? They're not told, well, now, there's, there's nothing you can do. The Lord will take care. No. What do we do? And they were told specifically, clearly what they were to do those believers. Repent, that is make that spiritual U-turn in your life, and be baptized, be baptized, be immersed in water for the remission or forgiveness of your sins. Now think about that. Their sins are forgiven. Another way of saying that certainly would be they're saved, right? They're saved from their sins. Now, can we do exactly what those people did 2,000 years ago? Well, of course we can. We can, we can follow those directions precisely, exactly like they did. At the end of that same chapter, you have this remarkable statement. The Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. Now think about that. They were saved in the early part of the chapter. They had their sins forgiven. And those same people were added to his church. Now, here's the point. If we do today what they did then, we can have forgiveness of sins. If we have those forgiveness of sins, then aren't we, don't we become a part of that same church they were added to by the Lord? If not, my friends, why not? The logic is inescapable. I know we've spanned the centuries. I know we're 2,000 years away from the day of Pentecost. But my friends, it still holds. It's still there. The message is still before us. Salvation, and then the Lord adds us to not a denomination, not some little sectarian group, but he adds us to his church. If not, why not? You can be in that one church today. We must be convicted, certain, confident that we are in that one body. I hope you are. I hope you can leave this morning again with that assurance, with that confidence, with that certainty. I'm a New Testament Christian. I'm in that one body. And if you're not, you need to be seriously thinking about it, studying about it, and coming to the knowledge of the truth. The only place to find the one church is not in any group's human traditions, but in the Word of God. The one body must be matched by that one faith we mentioned earlier in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, and again from the text that uh, Joe read. The one faith brings us into the one body. 
And the one baptism is that that brings us into that one body, you see. And all of that goes together and very much a part of uh, uh, what we're talking about this morning. Uh, the one body must be batched by the one faith. Let me give you and just one example. That one body in the New Testament church was very, very uh, autonomous as far as what we call local autonomy. The people in those congregations did not have a creed, a human creed. They did not have councils and, and conventions and, and big hierarchical systems. Each congregation was locally autonomous or self-ruled. They didn't have any kind of big denominational uh, uh, hierarchy or organization like we have today. That's just the fact. And that's what the church should be today. That one church, that one body. And if you're not in, if you're in or out of this church, do you believe that one can be just in that one church? I hope you do. I hope you have that conviction. We talk a lot in Churches of Christ about the restoration plea. It is the plea to go back to the Word of God, to span the ages, to go from 2013 back beyond the creeds and standards and councils and confessions of men, back to the New Testament and find the essentials of that church in the first century and bring them forward to the 20th century. That's our plea and our cause, and we spend lifetimes doing that very thing, to go back to the Bible and find uh, what we can be with the one church in mind. And again, let me quote another passage that we used last week. Romans chapter, or John chapter 12, verse 48. The word Jesus said, I have spoken, will judge him in the last day. My friend, we're not condemning anybody this morning. We're not condemning anybody to hell. All we're saying is that the Lord in Judgment Day will, will call us to account for the very word that He's spoken about this subject and about all others. You and I will answer to Him for this issue and again, all others. I'm not your judge. No church is your judge. But the word that the Lord spoke will be that judge in the last day. Now my question what do you believe about the one church now? Would you like to be in that one church that you read about? As we said a moment ago, you can be baptized and, and have your sins forgiven exactly like they did on the day of Pentecost. Just like they did. And then you'll be a part of the body of Christ, the one church. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And not in, we're, we're not talking about joining anybody's denomination, but be just a part of the one body of Christ. If you need to respond now, won't you please, while together we stand and sing.